Good afternoon. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, I, I have a, I'm very confused about the term media in general. It's not like uh, I study history of arts and then like uh, media in Spanish has a, a very good way to differentiate from the media in English because it's supported like technique, like painting or sculpture or whatever. Then in the first talk, I think um, uh, he differentiated very well when he was talking about like film archaeology, like as a, as, a, as a media archaeology. But in the second talk, I got totally confused again because media is also like uh, press or information, communication media. Uh, so I would like to know when uh, media was used also like a, a communication media as well as for media as uh, technology only. Like uh, in the last 15 years, like uh, when you go to an exhibition or exhibition and he gave uh, a lot of examples about video installations and so on, when you see multimedia, everybody immediately thinks in video, computer graphics and so all these kind of things. Then uh, you said like uh, media archaeology is only referred to the technology, technology media and so on. So for me it's all like uh, media is medium and then um, when you said already TV and um, mass media and <laughs> media age all became even more confused. So I would like uh, uh, if you could clarify the term why is used media for these kind of like things for technology or for like the, the digital or so on. Thank you. Are you addressing this question to both of us? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you first. I, I'll go first, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I do, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that you come from art history because art historians are very reluctant to use the word medium. For many art historians to this day, there's a radical distinction to be made between me medium and artwork. And I do sympathize with that. And in the second part of the paper that I didn't present, I was actually given an argument of how a medium might come back to the status of art. So I acknowledge the difference, but in my talk, I've also shown you how fragile that distinction is. Because if we take what you suggest, that medium usually indicates or implies that the bearer of a particular message is in some sense technologically mediated. Art history has a strong investment in originality, uniqueness, and a creator. And of course, the very term medium, when we do associate with technology, is reproducible. That, is, that was the great break that Walter Benjamin articulated in the work of art in the age of me mechanical reproducibility. What I have done in my talk is actually very delicately to point out, to begin to point out, that what art historians think of as unique and due to the inspiration or the skill of an individual creator has always already been saturated with both economic principles and technological principles. And so I'm coming from, if you like, technological media and build a bridge to saying artwork through their site specificity, through their boundaries, through their implicit philosophical ontologies are already infused and imbued with media. And so, for instance, uh, and I wasn't able to comment on that at greater length, when you talk about a movement, an artistic movement like Impressionism, it is dependent on the mobile easel, the one you can take with you, and that mobile easel only functions if you have the technology of color production, of paint production, including stabilizing paint with chemicals and sealing it with, within a tube. These are techniques and technologies developed at a particular point in time. 
And I also pointed out that many of the great artists uh, from, you know, after Cezanne, if you like, Degas and so on, always used a camera. Always used a camera, which they then repressed, the technology that they repressed, in order to still produce art. Or the debate that you probably know about Vermeer and others using technologies in order to produce their pictures. So as you go back, you see that there is almost no point in art history where you can say it's free of technology. And so the mediatic aspect of painting is there almost from the beginning. And that, that would be where media and art find themselves again. But another aspect where they find themselves, and this is what the paper, what I didn't say in my paper, is that if we actually accept that in some sense the cinema as we know it is obsolete, that obsolete has the potential to turning even a mechanically produced object back into art. If we assume classical aesthetics which says an artwork has to be disinterested, an artwork doesn't have to have a use. So all the technologies that are, be, that are now being made useless because they're obsolete re-emerge in the gallery space, in the museum space. So now when you go to a gallery, what do you see? You see a 60 millimeter projector with stuff around it, namely celluloid, and it's now a sculpture. So it's uselessness some way produces it, reproduces it in a, in a space, the museum, and in a form, namely disinterested and useless, where it classically functions as a work of art. Okay, since uh, the idea of this evening is to give you at least two different versions of media archaeology, I will fulfill my duty and answer to your question as well. Um, it's good that you ask for media because in the coffee before we discussed that there is a Babylonian uh, confusion about the use of the word medium, not only in one language, but between the languages, uh, the French, les media, and the Germans, and, and, and so. Okay, the, me teaching at university a discipline called media studies. The biggest confusion is most people, even most students, confuse media studies which, is, which concerns technology with mass media studies, which is communication studies. The content of the medium, as Marshall McLuhan pointed out brilliantly, should not be confused with the message of the medium. It public, public, public uh, well, communication studies in terms of content analysis of media effects up to social media effects, uh, web two, social media, what they politically mean and what they trigger. This is communication studies. Media studies, if we take the term medium, when did it appear in the public discourse? Because for centuries, almost nobody had the need to use the term medium. It appeared on the book title of Marshall McLuhan when something had escalated, the electronic media. They are, so, they are something different from the previous cultural techniques. It deserves to call it media. And where did he, where did he get the, the notion from? From Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon, who wrote the mathematical theory of communication in the information sense, which you mentioned, he clearly defines what is a medium. It is what happens in between the sender and the receiver, in the channel. The channel can be analog, now it is processional, it's computing, that all happens in between. When you download or watch a YouTube video, you normally don't, do not see what happens in between, but that is where the medium takes place. We don't see a medium. When we look at the screen, we don't see a medium. The medium is what happens in between. And that is fascinating, what is happening in between. And I would say that there is more cinematography technically happening in between now. And uh, that, to, to close this, um, um, I uh, want to come to media art. The very term media art or media arts is an indication of something different. Traditional arts were called straightforward, sculpture, painting, architecture. These are proper names. This is a proper techne in the, in the handicraft sense. Media art is an umbrella term. It's a composite. 
and it so clearly shows that media art it's mainly about a technology being the message with which so-called artists or designers or whoever, academics, experiment. But the message is more than before, uh, the medium is the message. Early video art is all about experimenting with the electronic image itself. Uh, early cinematography was very soon experimenting and that's why chronophoto chronophotography was so fascinating. It was experimenting with the possibilities of the medium. So I think for art and aesthetics, uh, it means medium is technology. And every young generation now experiments with the technology. It's just that the technology isn't that easy anymore. Nowadays, you have to know what coding is. And that's what I told my students at the Cologne Academy of Media Arts, one of the new institutions, which don't teach old arts anymore, but they start with new ones. Now, there, half of the artists use proprietary commercial software to produce interesting things. But the other group of students, they learned how to put a pixel on the computer screen. That is basic. But in order to do that, I repeat myself, you have to learn a bit of coding and things like that and know how a computer works. And that's why it's a different kind of art uh, which, which, which comes out. And that's why media art is a good uh, term because it says it is the art der 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 derived from the technology itself. And maybe that's the, the biggest difference in media studies. Most of my colleagues would say it's nice to know the technology but what counts is the effects it has on single humans or the society. Now, but with a philosophical approach, with a knowledge-driven approach, with an academic humanities-driven approach, it's our task to learn the communication theory and look at it and understand the technologies and express technologies in words which the engineers would never do. That's our task. And we do it in an aesthetic way. You do it as a media artist or media designer. We do it as academics. No, I just uh, thank you for the interesting conversations and and the lecture you give us. I just want to reflect on one thing that uh, when we think about media archaeology and uh, especially the, f uh, the first talk about the, the ancient ways of painting and how it relates to current digital cinema, just, uh, just a thinking, just a thought, just a, just a reflection. Uh, I was thinking about Coco Chanel and the, 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 the question of uh, weaving, of tapestry, of how uh, somehow uh, the looms, the old looms, are connected with uh, technology, of, uh, with images, and also with coding. Because as you know, the, the automatization of looms is the beginning of the codification that uh, the first computers uh, use the, the cards that the computers uh, were using to code was the same technology of the looms. So I want to connect somehow you know, another uh, ignored or despised technology, which is the looms and the, the work of tapestry and the tejedoras, no, I don't know, the, the weaving machines, no, that, and how they are linked to the technological, you were the, the second speech, you know, the Wolfgang was talking about, you know, this technological and how these looms, uh, automatized looms, are also technologies in that sense, you know, or not. I mean, it's my, my own reflection about that. That's a very Thanks. good point, um, and it's actually in a, in a film by the man that I mentioned, Harun Faraki, called Viman Seat. He actually gives a genealogy where he connects the IBM computer to the Hollerit cards, which is what you're referring to, which are de themselves derived from 
the, the programming of a loom, the jacquard loom. So that line is well established in media history, if you like, or media archaeology. And indeed, it opens up all kinds of different speculations about, first of all, about automation. What is it actually that, that is being automated? And the second one, as you possibly want to hint at, is that uh, women's work and women's skills should be written back into what is primarily a male history. And there is another connection, um, which is now often drawn, between the first photograph by Talbot, or, well, Talbot is one of the first uh, uh, um, photographers, uh, Babbage, who uh, invented a particular automated uh, calculating machine, and Ada Lovelace, the woman that uh, he was connected with, and she was one of the first computer programmers in that sense. So there is a history to be dug up that writes both weaving and uh, um, what you said, the loom, Jakartu in particular, back into history of the genealogy of the computer. And then once more, it's a brilliant, I agree, it's b b brilliant that you mentioned this example. We can point out the difference between a history of technology and an archaeology of it. Exactly by mentioning Ada Lovelace. There is an, uh, until, to, until ancient Greece, there is weaving has been considered as a sort of mathematical science. Now, and there is a jacquard loom, and there is a, a brilliant book, which is a book on so-called dead media, which is called A Collection of Many Problems Extracted of the Ancient and Modern Philosophers. It, it looks like an 18th century book, but in, it includes a lot of media like, like uh, this punched uh, tape, uh, which, which is of course the, the famous Jacquard mechanism of uh, producing a textile. But then Ada Lovelace, she says, what is the drastic difference which separates 2,000 years of weaving patterns from computing? Because she says algebraic formulas can be used to weave patterns. Now this is a different approach. It's it's not the mechanical approach. It's not it's it's not even automation. That would be called a trivial machine, like Heinz von Försters and others call it. But it is from the heart and core of mathematics itself. You can weave patterns. You can produce pl flowers. You can produce sound. And you can produce virtual worlds. All what computing is. But this Ada Lovelace approach which is radically mathematic and says from that basis is if mathematics is put into action in the form of a machine, which is the computer, that is different from using machines as mechanical and produce things. So your example reminds of the drastic change and rupture and discontinuity which took place in modernity between the weaving tradition and computing. So it's, it's both yeah. genealogical and archaeological. It's, uh, w historians tend to emphasize the continuities. Archaeologists, in my point of view, Me too. Yeah, the look breaks. at the, 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 at the breaks, that you, may, you mentioned it. And this is a challenge, but, but the, to, to think the break is a challenge because, of course, we humans, we tend to narrate, to configure ourselves as some coherent biography, whatever. To think in discontinuities is a training, but if we want to understand media culture of today, it's a, continu it's, it's a culture of discontinuities. If you go down to the bits, if you go down to the algorithms, if you go down to the filmic frame, uh, if you go down to the samplings in audio culture, we are now in a non-linear time and in a time of discontinuities. And the closer we look at technologies, we more become aware of it. And if we derive 
from that consequences of how to write culture or how to think about our own memories, that's another thing, but it's certainly enriching. Maybe instead of discontinuity, one could also say repetition with a difference. Well, that would be <laughs> a bit more, a bit less harmful, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I just, want, uh, just wanted to ask you both, uh, since you mentioned the difficulties of uh, media archaeology, if there are any institutions, art centers, that you think that are doing a good job trying to uh, represent media archaeology through conventional or non-conventional exhibitions, or either physical or, or online. Well, there, um, I mean, there are lots of places. Uh, there's the uh, ZKM in Karlsruhe that probably one would mention first. Um, there are the various media labs, the Harvard Media Lab, the MIT Media Lab, I would mention. Um, I'm not sure whether you think of institutions... Um, I haven't visited, but I think that the Museum of Moving Image is based on this kind of emulation, for example, with video games and such. So since you were um, arguing about what's best or not best in terms of yes. not only providing a, sculpt, a sculptor of sorts, which, which uh, places, either art-based or not, could be or seem to be better at, at understanding what has to be done or what can be done so that media archaeology is actually produced or generated or represented, if possible, of course, because yes. that's tricky. I'm, I, 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 if I can just uh, answer your question first, I, I, have an, I have a kind of divided um, feeling about this. I think uh, museums of the moving image, which are usually cinema museums, don't do a very good job. They are completely committed to linear uh, genealogies uh, and uh, false teleologies. Um, I think in some sense the artists that are now entering the museum with you know, cinematic, proto-cinematic, para-cinematic uh, works, let's say Tacit Adin, to mention one of the most famous ones who uh, is committed to celluloid as, a, as an artistic medium. She says, I'm not a filmmaker, I make art with film. You see, so, so that would be one way, and there are lots of others who enter into the museum space with obsolete technology. I mentioned that, you know, that's, there's uh, uh, Rosa Barbara, who is another one who obsessively works with uh, 50, 60 millimeter projectors. Uh, there, there are, uh, there's a couple, um, Gibson and Recorder, who actually burn celluloid and, and you're in this space like a phantasmagoria, you get the smell of burning celluloid while you see the image disintegrate. So these are all ways of restaging, if you like, the special effects of the cinematic machine. Uh, but I also think that one of the things that, that media archaeology is very good at, and I, I try to kind of hint at this, is also to turn technologies into philosophies. You know, that, and, and this is a ta task that museums are generally, can be quite good at, because anything that enters a museum is already in a sp different ontological space. And, and so I very much look at uh, uh, contemporary works of installation art that use moving image or bits of, a tech, you know, of the cinematic apparatus uh, from that perspective. So I'm very fond, for instance, of Anthony McCall uh, and his work of, you know, he was big in the 70s. Uh, Dan Graham is another one, big in the 70s, that have re-emerged and are now representing their work. And now it has a completely different meaning and I'm very interested in how 
if you like, the digital divide or the digital turn has actually allowed certain practices to become philosophical op you know, operations. But you, you ask whether there are institutions. Well, no, not many institutions, not many art schools, but, but there, are, there are labs. Look at the so-called labs. Jussi Parika, he has a brilliant blog on this. He, he, uh, in the so-called labs, you, you mentioned Laurie Emerson's uh, lab, um, there are, uh, even now I've been to, to, to Ankara in Turkey where it was opened, a lab. This is the sort of taken over from science, the idea that you have a space where you tinker, experiment, do analytics with media. And this is not an institution. It has not advanced to, to art schools, not yet. But this is the form which is not simply a, a single artist, but it's a space. It's an epistemological, a techno-epistemological space. And there will be a book soon appearing by Parika and, and Emerson and Wenschler, Wenschler um, called, uh, I think it's The Lab Culture or something? I yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Um, this is the new genre, which is already post the idea of you need big academies to do that. You have a lab. And that's very attractive uh, to, to artists and academics and engineers, and they meet there. And there are a lot of labs which you can immediately find just entering something like media archaeological labs. Um, um, and this is the space where it takes place. Bueno, des, desde mi sujeción a eso, a la obsolescencia del cine y mi desde mi sujeción a la obsolescencia del cine y mi supina ignorancia sobre muchos aspectos de los nuevos media, eh, sí que me ha dado la sensación en sus dos discursos, con diferencias entre ambos, pero de enfatear un cierto formalismo tecnológico. Es decir, buena parte de lo que nos han planteado es, correspondería a un formalismo tecnológico. Tal vez eso también esté vinculado a esa, a esa propuesta arqueológica cuando tradicionalmente la arqueología ha sido en todo caso una fuente para el trabajo histórico. Es decir, nos están proponiendo quedarnos en el terreno arqueológico y no entrar en la dimensión histórica de los media aunque sea contemporáneos, tal vez también eso venga de la mano de esa usurpación que eh, se plantea por parte del concepto tecnología respecto al concepto técnica. Efectivamente, en toda la historia del arte ha habido técnicas. Ahora, ¿por qué se llaman tecnologías? Tal vez es un intento de darle un matiz académico, una sublimación sobre algo que a lo mejor es tan trivial como técnico, que muchas veces no está, diríamos, en el terreno ni de lo artístico ni de lo científico. Bueno, son, de, ya digo, desde la supina ignorancia ciertas cosas que me da la sensación de enfatear en este tipo de discurso. Bueno, well, yeah. um, is a difference between technique and technology. Art has been technique. Greek, techne, Latin, ars, has been a, handy, a craft, it has been a technique related to the skills of the human body or human mind. Technology different, differs from that in one aspect. The action is taking place within the machine. That's a difference. It's decoupling the artistic creation and letting the machine become a co-creator itself. Henry Fox Talbot, when he published his book on his invention of photography, The Pencil of Nature, the of nature he celebrated how his invention liberated images from the subjective interpretation of his hand. 
suddenly light could be impressed in a mechanism without a human artistic hand. He was a failed artist, but he actively celebrated. He was fascinated that there can be a non-human art or technique. And this is what separates technology from cultural technique. And that has consequences for aesthetics and for the philosophy and scholastic thinking, which you mentioned, is actually the switching point between translating, translating the old idea of art into a more technological one with the time of perspective, Nicole Orem and other scholars who suddenly thought mathematically about things which normally were done by the artistic hand. That's my answer. Yeah, it's a fascinating uh, question, and um, there are several layers of answer. And one, one could be, and I'm not quite sure whether I understood you quite right, is a question of technological determinism. And, and there one could draw a distinction between uh, McLuhan's notion, or one of many in McLuhan's notion, that, that the, the media are an extension of human senses an extension, an amplification. But you could counter, counter that with, let's say, someone like Friedrich Kittler, who would turn it around and say, human beings are nothing other than the technologies they use for communication. That's not exactly technological determinism, but it is a different definition of that relationship between human beings and the technologies that sustain them. And, and, you know, then the first tool is already a technology for survival, a struggle for survival. So if you balance those two, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have a relationality that clearly now seems to be moving in one direction, that is the machine, rather than the other, but none of the senses. But then also we shouldn't forget how incredibly adaptable human beings are. I'll give you one example. Around the 1860s, when cameras t left the studio and went out in the street because the exposure times were short enough to capture an image, and I showed you one, the Daguerre one about the street, there was this notion that there was too much detail in the photograph in the street, and it was driving human beings mad. It was dangerous to look at a photograph. And Charles Baudelaire actually called it, there was a riot of detail. And he used the, the French word émeute. And the émeute means a popular uprising. So detail staged a revolution. And Baudelaire, being a conservative, wasn't very pleased with that. And Baudelaire had a very ambivalent relationship to photography. But that is, you know, you see these cultural moments, you know, where you realize a new technology presents extraordinary challenges to the human sensorium, but within one generation, the human brain, the human sensorium has adapted itself to that. And I am a generation that cannot multitask in the way my students can multitask between a mobile phone, the television on, uh, to talking to somebody in the room, all doing it at the same time. So, you, if, you, if you're worried about technological determinism or about robots or, you know, the world being taken over by machines, just reflect on that one moment of the, in the 1860s of people thinking you, 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 you couldn't look at a photograph with too much detail. Same thing happened with uh, the arrival of the cinema. People said you cannot watch a film for more than 15 minutes, otherwise you do damage to your brain. And if now, now everybody used to talk, my generation still talks about Overload, information overload. Well, your children and certainly your grandchildren won't even know what you're talking about. So we should be a little more sanguine about that particular relationship between human brains and human bodies and technology that shapes them or that they shape. But there is, in specific case of the cinema, an extremely interesting point which uh, Wolfgang just, just hinted at, namely automation. From the beginning of film studies and film theory, this was the sore point because 
whether it was Bela Balash, whether it was Rudolf Arnheim, uh, almost everybody, with the exception of Jean Epstein, were saying automation, the fact that cinema automat automatically records the world makes it ineligible as an art form. It cannot be art because it's automatic. It was the already mentioned Andre Bazin who said, no, it's the other way around. Automation has liberated, in the way that Wolfgang just, just mentioned about Fox Talbot, has liberated the world from this endless and obsessive subjectification. And when we now have philosophers, whether it's Alain Badiou, whether it's Jacques Rancière, uh, whether it's even uh, somebody more conventional like Stanley Cavell, automation is now a positive value. And if you go a little bit further to the already mentioned object-oriented ontologists, you see that precisely what is at stake is that machines liberate us from this endless meaning-seeking, subject-imposing uh, impulse in the world. And we're better off, we're better off not putting so much meaning into the world and find ways and machines and technologies that let the world disclose itself for us. This is the Heideggerian Jean-Luc Nancy uh, part of that argument. Yeah. So your question is very philosophical and very topical. And uh, if I may follow up, um, it's not only that humans miraculously adopt to technologies after a short period of shock, but uh, what makes human human, different from other animals? We are using language which is the most <laughs> radical coding of an animated being that one can think of. So if we define what makes the human human, and if we relate it to articulated language, not just producing noises, then we are already on the machinic side. And the inventor of computing as we know it today, Alan Turing, uh, wrote it in his seminal paper, when we are doing a calculation in our mind, five plus eight, equals 13, at that moment, we are in a computer state. Now, it's not just that humans adopt to technologies, they are themselves, the human, is technological. And I mentioned Turing for one reason, because I think the, in between the lines, <laughs> this evening, the question was, why do we need the term and the method media archaeology? Because for most of the things we say and we discuss now, we say, we could say this is good historical consciousness, that is good historical reflection, this is good theory of history, of technology, of culture, of everything. Why do we need, why do we need a new term like media archaeology at all for that? But now let us compare, Nin the year 1936, Walter Benjamin writes his famous essay on the work of art in the age of technical reproduction. It's a brilliant, re I read that every semester with my students and it's, it's now common basic knowledge for media studies, it's cultural Bible, studies, it's, Bible, it's the Bible. Bible of media studies. But this kind of thinking is still within human traditional culture. It integrates technology within the history of human culture. At the same year, a single man in his little room, Alan Turing in Cambridge at Jesus College, writes a meta-mathematical paper in which he theoretically invents a, a machine which we later call computer, which was first called Turing machine. This could not be integrated. I think in the year 1936, not to talk about other political events in Spain or in Germany, a radical divide happened. Something new happened in European knowledge. And to describe the new thing, 
for that we still are struggling to invent new terms in order not to describe the radical new challenge of media culture still in our old semantic cultural terms. And for that we need media archaeology. That's why I, I'm so radical on this, radical. But that is exactly yeah. why I call it a symptom and a placeholder and not a new way of generating knowledge. Yeah, but it's our task not only to di diagnose to analyze the you're symptom. A, you're, a little, you're a generation younger than I am. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, well, maybe, but you, I you, grew up your, in... Your media archaeology, yeah. your definition of media archaeology will make the very term media archaeology obsolete. Well, I, 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 I was, like you, among the first to teach a new course of studies which is called media studies. Other, other film studies is older, art history is much older, philosophy is much, much older, but for a new science, it's the task n not only to be uh, an analyst of new phenomena in culture, but to actively offer new terms to help our society to become at least as, as fast as the media already are, to think what is the the computational image, image compression and things like that, that is so much more complicated and fascinating than looking at an old cinematographic image that we have to speed up. And I think it's a, an active task of this young discipline called media studies to develop such terms. That's why I think a more active, uh, have a more active attitude. That's, per that's perfectly possible, uh, as for the sake of this particular conference or for the sake of certain work that I do, I, I do stick with the cinema, film history as media archaeology with a question mark which the, 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 um, the publisher refused, you refused you to, to add, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but the, the, I can bring it to a point, I, you see what we're also talking about and what your question raises is is a term like posthuman? Is it actually a meaningful term, or is it just yet another way of being awkward with language by putting a post in front of something one wants to retain? As far as the cinema is concerned, with these arguments we said about automation and, and, and the senses and so on, I always ask myself, looking back at, at the history of cinema, which is very short, has it been an accelerator or an emergency break on that relationship between, on the one hand, the, uh, the human-machine interface or, and this is more in the way that, that Wolfgang is arguing, or on the relationship of for God knows how many centuries we've used what we now call natural language, but language as that which models the world for us. We have entered an age where it is mathematics that models the world for us. And I think that is the crucial difference. We've always used language and philosophy, much, much of philosophy, certainly up to Derrida, is all about saying you cannot think without language. And there was Gilles Deleuze who, who claimed you can think with images, with moving images. But I think these are all ways of trying to come to grips with this, to me, quite scary notion, which is the Turing notion, that you can model a world with mathematics. And mathematics is not something that we naturally use to communicate. So that, to me, is the big challenge, and you are a, a very prominent representative of precisely the school that says that the world can and must be modeled with mathematics. I have a question. Um, um, Thomas, you have defined media archaeology as a symptom, and al you also use the term answer. And Wolfgang, um, you understand media archaeology as a research method and a way to address subjects, among other things. So my question, maybe it's a little bit naive, but uh, and maybe it's for both of you. I was wondering if it is possible to think out autonomously, these two terms, methods and answers. Um, 
did I actually use the word answer? Because I'm now a little bit uh, at a loss to think what I could possibly have meant by answer. Uh, what I certainly um, said that I didn't think that media archaeology was a methodology, and, and uh, Wolfgang reasserted that he thought it was a methodology. But then, you know, as you notice, we have we use the same term, but we give it a different inflection, if not a different meaning. Um, maybe, maybe what I the the way I would go about it is is to say that once you break up. Well, once you, you understand that linearity and indeed a certain form of causality is not what holds events together, that the very issue of history, what is history? I mean, I have a particular argument about, uh, about the cinema in relation to history because a classic definition of history and where it differs from memory and to a different degree also from the archive uh, and these are three terms that I, I, I kind of problematize, history, the archive, and memory. Um, they have to do with material traces or embodied, uh, an embodied past and a past simply there in terms of its residue. And the cinema has blurred these categories because images, first of all, in a very banal sense, those who appear, human beings that appear in images, uh, are neither fully alive nor are they really dead. They have entered into what I call an uncanny ontology in the way that, that uh, robotics uses the uncanny valley as a term where you cannot decide is it machine or is it human. So uh, in that sense, uh, the cinema represents an uncanny ontology. And that has implications and indeed you could say that we're now uh, so comfortable in handling non-linear uh, ways of accessing information. Okay, most people say it has to do with digital digitization and uh, you know ma machine memory and so on, which is so different from human memory. And nonetheless, you know we use the same term. Is it now that our memory is a metaphor for machine memory, or are we borrowing human memory to transcribe to trans you know to describe something? which is mechanical and very different. But one way of saying what the cinema has brought into the world is montage. That is a cutting up of continuity. And then we come back to chronophotography and, and the link that the chronophotography makes to uh, you know, the computer. Or take uh, Friedrich Kittler's most famous book, gramophone uh, film or <coughs> typewriter. Um, again, you know, there is a way of, of, of creating bits of... of of, as it, as it were, you know, looking at these technologies as producing discrete entities rather than flow and continuity. And on the other hand, you have Gilles Deleuze, who is all into duration, flow, and, and, and who would never say that there is an individual image other than that it is a stilled image of a movement. And he will even say that if you look at a stone, even the stone has movement if you extend the time scale. And he's right. You see, so uh, I, don't, I don't know whether I'm answering a question. I'm sure I'm not, but <laughs> I'm, making a, I'm making a point about why uh, I am hesitant about using the term methodology in something which uh, Wolfgang himself says is entirely in between processual and... But how we actually map this process into categories that we're more familiar with, that's the challenge. And um, I think um, media archaeology can be established as a method which is able to give answers, define what is a medium in a technical sense, and define should we what is an image in times of computation, whereas, which Thomas just explained, chronophotography which as a core of what the processuality of cinematography is, is what is nowadays called sampling. Take time discrete snapshots of the world. That's what analog to digital conversion nowadays is. It's, in that way, it's cinematographical. It's just that once more, media archaeology in its act, 
if it tries to be active and not just an analysis of symptoms, helps us to rethink the term of the image. Should we call a digital photography still photography? Should we call a computational image still image? Because the difference between, now, now that we just touched about the structural similarity between chronophotography and computation, the difference is, of course, there is an analog physical trace, the famous indexicality. There is a physical event in which is recorded on the film exposure. In computation, it's a radical discontinuity abstraction. The image does not exist as an image within the computer. And just because it looks on the interface, it's made to look it's like something which our eyes recognize as an image. It's an emulation of Actually, a yeah, it's a lie about what is happening. And there, media archaeology as a method has to be very active to actively point a finger into that wound and say, rethink, please, our cultural familiar terms of the image. And I would even add, rethink the term history. History is one way of dealing with heritage of the past, but it's not the only. Yeah. And media archaeology <laughs> tries to develop a different time concept, times in the plural even. And um, for that we need active terms, active theories, active methods, and this is all being done. I think media archaeology is already developing into an active research method into a theory, into a practice, almost all the qualities which a discipline or a sub-discipline needs to be qualified. And I think the fact that now Barcelona, some weeks ago Ankara, um, many places on the world are fascinated by media archaeology is because it, is, it can help us to finally reflect about digital media culture uh, in an active way. So I'm very confident about the possibilities of media archaeology. Uh, if you, you see, if, if you, uh, Wolfgang just mentioned uh, indexicality, you know, one of those things where you, you think you can map the break between analog and digital. But I think it's a fetish. It's a pure fetish, because what about if you call indexicality metadata? Which is it not? Well, I would argue that it, that is that... Metadata is uh, meta the order of the symbolical. It's an arbitrary symbolical uh, operation, whereas the physical trace... Uh, well, the physical trace, if you take it, is, yeah. is, is uh, an arbitrary uh, alignment of silver particles and we come back to, uh, you know, the, the, we, we keep talking about uh, the, the, the analog image and then we go to the digital image. And you have been so eloquent about actually the other image, which is the electronic image. Of, uh, and, 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 you know, somewhere in between, the index disappears. And, and I would prefer to now, in that translation, to, to actually see to what extent a concept like metadata can actually cover also something that happens in the, in the analog image if we see it as an accumulation of silver particles. But that's one aspect. But at the same time, I do, I, you see, if we just go back, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to use the term media archaeology, but it is because it is such a vague term that I like it, because it allows all kinds of other distinctions to be accommodated without it being you know, claimed by different disciplines. That, for me, is the, the, the great uh, advantage, that there isn't really such a thing as media studies or media philosophy or m whatever. Everybody calls it something else. It's there is something like media studies and media philosophy <laughs> and media theory and media archaeology. Yeah. Yes. He's com he comes from Germany, I come from, yes, from the English realm, which is completely different. But just one point that you just mentioned, chronophotography. If you study uh, uh, Edward Mybridge and uh, Etienne Jules Marais, everybody thinks that they're doing the same thing, chronophotography. They are worlds apart. 
They are total different planets, these two. And that is why I like to keep the, the vagueness of these terms, because only media archaeology allows me to actually point out why their difference is significant.